Hello everyone and welcome back to another video and in today's video I'm doing the first part in a series in which I go do my Q&A's within my community board post so this is basically like a YouTube automation cash cow channel question and answer in which if you're subscribed to the channel you know that I'll be posting my community board ask any questions and do those questions I'll be answering in this video so before we get started I do want to invite you to watch my free masterclass training where I go over how to make passive income through YouTube in 90 videos or less so it's absolutely free the link is down below in the description so do check that out after this video so the first question is asked by Gracie Rose and she's asking how focused should your niche be can it be somewhat diverse or not really when it comes to niche selection it's kind of like common in a sense that don't be posting things that are just so black and white so what I mean by that is don't be posting videos about fitness and then be posting videos about celebrities unless it's like celebrity fitness or another example is like don't be posting videos about travel and then don't be posting videos about crypto it's okay to start general but then eventually narrow down. So to kind of give you an idea, if you're starting a travel channel, start with sub niches such as travel places in Europe, travel places in the United States, travel places in the Philippines. If you're starting a sports channel, start by posting golf videos, football videos, basketball videos, tennis videos. You can start broad, but then eventually do narrow down. So to kind of give you an idea, I have like a TV shows channel and eventually I narrowed down. I was posting about movies, upcoming movies, upcoming TV shows, and eventually I just narrowed down to a singular TV show. And that's what's working for me on that channel particular same thing with sports everyone who's ever watched my videos I'm pretty sure you know that I'm from a very very adamant about sports I started with basketball videos uh, football videos and soccer videos but eventually I just dialed down to basketball videos even a particular basketball team it's about how far as I go your niche start broad but then eventually narrow down but don't be posting black and white videos now the next question comes from spark prime and he's asking can you walk us through your process for automating a YouTube channel from start to finish what tools or software do you use and how do you decide which tasks to automate? I'll probably create a really long video outlining how to automate a YouTube channel. I think I just recently released like a 30 minute training on how to start a YouTube automation channel. And I also offer a comprehensive course down below in the description, how to actually start a YouTube automation channel. And so with that course, it does include a membership. I reply to all questions asked me within my the private Discord group and the private Facebook group. But to kind of just go through the gist of it as far as what tools or software that I'm using and which tasks to automate. YouTube automation, okay? So it starts with an idea, then it goes to script writing, voiceover, video editing, quality check, and then publish and upload, and then thumbnail and title. Thumbnail and title are done like the same thing. Of those eight things I roughly named, I do the ideas, the script writing is outsourced, the voiceover work is outsourced, the video editing is outsourced, the thumbnail design, I sometimes do it, but it's also outsourced, but then I title every single one of my videos. So I'm the one coming up with the ideas with videos, and I'm also the one actually titling the videos. And then as far as uploading and publishing, the sometimes that's me, but that's also sometimes a manager of the channel. For your YouTube channel, you can actually give someone access so that they can actually upload to your channel, but they don't delete anything off your channel. So moving on to the next question we have from KK. At what point of insufficient results do you decide to drop the channel and continue with another? After changing stuff up, etc., I still see no improvement. I know that there's this thing called like a 33 rule in which if you post 33 videos and nothing's working, then kind of ditch the niche. You can really get a good gauge of 30 videos is a whole lot, okay? In reality, I do think that you should get some sort of direction within those first 30 videos, but I've tried channels in which I posted quite a bit amount of videos, like 90 plus videos, and it still wasn't working to the extent. I, it was like just simply breaking even. And I talked about this within my YSS in which I had two celebrity channels and I switched the niches of those just because it's been quite some time and they weren't making much money, you kind of have to follow your inner gut feeling, okay? If you really know your niche well, if you know that you're coming up with good topics, good ideas, good thumbnails and titles, good content, then just strive through and continue posting because eventually one of them is gonna work. If you're achieving good metrics, eventually, something will work. But as far as like actually giving up on a channel, I wouldn't say that I necessarily ever gave up on a channel. I did switch niches. Then that normally just comes from the innate feeling of saying, I'm not really passionate about this niche. I don't really know this niche. I don't even like this niche. I only went in it just because I saw another channel doing it as well. So that's when I decided to make the decision of actually switching niches and such. There's no hard number. I wish I can give you a hard number, but let's move on to the next question. Wyzik XYZ is asking, what is the best practice to do to not run to demonetization later down the road? The number one tip I can give you when it comes to not running to demonetization is to start from scratch. I've talked to probably so many people as far as who's stayed monetized and who's 
been demonetized. The most common pattern that I'm seeing is that if you buy a pre-monetized channel, which is something that I'm totally against, you are likely, or there's a high possibility chance in which you're gonna get demonetized in the future. People who have started their channels from absolutely scratch, absolutely from zero, they have not been demonetized. So the common pattern I'm seeing is start from scratch, don't do a pre-monetize. But now you might be asking, you know, if I start from scratch, then I'm gonna fall behind. If you can't get a video to work starting from scratch, let alone what makes you think you can get a video to work even starting pre-monetized. You kind of see the two similar scenarios. One's pre-monetized, one's not monetized, but you're still not gonna make any money. I do understand that if a video works and you're not monetized, yeah, you're gonna lose out, lose out some money, but if a video works, you're gonna get monetized just like that. The next question is Livy the effect girl. So this is quite a long question. With regards to video editing, it seems that in your process, you ask the video editors to source the video. However, this doesn't seem like the normal process, especially for more experienced video editors. It seems like a waste of your time. So Livy is asking, should we hire a researcher instead of to gather those materials? Livy, there should be video editors who are experienced enough to actually source the video files and then also edit the video. You shouldn't be having to pay for two different roles in which one is a researcher and then one is actually editing the video together. That's normally my video editor. However, I do have script writers who are actually really, really good at script writing. And so what they do is that they actually copy and paste the YouTube links into the script and so that the video editors actually have a source as to what they're talking about. And so they just click in the link and actually add that to the video. You can either ask your video editors to do it or you can ask your script writers to do it depending on what type of video it is. The Vaporian is asking, should I post shorts and long form content on a new channel to cross promote instead? Shorts can get more subs, but I heard posting on the long form with tracks to my audience would hurt my long form content in the long run. Viperian has an absolute great question and it comes down to, should I combine shorts with long form content? So here's my spiel with that. Short form content doesn't necessarily attract the same audience that would be interested with your long form content. But don't get me wrong, a lot of people have like the misconception that, okay, if I get a ton of subscribers with my shorts, they're most certainly gonna be interested in my long form content. That isn't always necessarily the case. For that reason, I don't post shorts on my long form content channels just because I specialize in long form content channels. Shorts to me, that's like something else to experiment on. If you wanna post shorts, I would recommend posting that on a different channel, unless you are 100% sure that the audience that your shorts are attracting would also be interested in your long form content videos. But again, that's a hard thing to say because that's like saying that people who watch TikTok also watch YouTube. It doesn't, like it makes sense, but I feel like that's not necessarily true in all cases. For the next question, we have Malaysians discusses. He's or she is asking, how do you deal with copyright strikes, especially unfairly done to? If you know you're missing, or if you're using the footage under fair use, do you fight back and let them sue you or lie low and let the nine days pass or do you try to talk it out. There's a lot of miscellaneous information added as well, like a lot of added details. To answer this question, when you receive a copyright strike, I do try to email the individual. I try to work things out, I try to talk things out, but nine out of 10 times, that email doesn't get a reply, I and mean, it sucks. I don't really fight it back. I just let the 90 days pass, and I try to stay away from that type of content, and then I just proceed with it. In my entire like three plus years of doing YouTube, I probably only received like three copyright strikes. The 90 days did pass. To kind of give you an idea, I received the copyright strikes in TV shows, and I re received two copyright strikes in the anime niche. So I entirely ditched the anime niche, but even so, Try to talk it out, and if that doesn't work, just wait the 90 days. And also, of course, avoid that type of video topic in the future. As for the next question, Yogesh Babu is asking, how do I retain a voiceover artist if they leave sometime in the future and work on their own channel? What else can you do? For my channels, I have multiple voiceover artists. I always have at least two. So that's kind of my caveat with that in which I try to make sure that I always have a backup voiceover artist. I never really have a dedicated single voiceover artist to a single channel. A lot of these YouTube names are actually quite hard to pronounce. Zuck's next is asking, is it possible to find success where there's a lot of competition in your niche? Even more, if I like that niche, should I change niches if there's a competition? Competition on YouTube, okay? You guys are really gonna like this one. There is competition no matter what niche you go into, okay? That is a fact, but the thing is that there's so many different angles and so many different ways you can approach a niche and enter that niche and actually be different. Let's take sports, for example. If I'm just gonna start making top 10 things you didn't know about LeBron James, 10 things you didn't know about Kyrie Irving, 10 things you didn't know about Kevin Durant, that's a very mediocre way to kind of enter a niche. There's so many different ways and angles you can kind of tackle videos that can kind of make you brand new and fresh and make you the only person doing that within that niche to make you stand out. I don't believe in competition simply just because one person who watches my video can also watch my quote unquote competitor's video. It all just makes sense. Well, one person is not just designated to watching a single video. We all watch multiple videos, right? So don't be worried too much about competition. I would much rather you worry about, do you know the niche well enough? And if so, go into it, go into it. If you know how to lose weight, go into that niche. If you know sports so well, go into it. If you know how to make money online, 
go into that niche because trust me, there's always going to be competition. Don't let that draw that back from you. And at the same time, just try and think of a different angle of videos to kind of introduce to that audience though. So it's like selling a product. You know, there's so many different types of vacuum cleaners, for example, but sometimes there's something so unique about that vacuum cleaner that even though they're selling such an old product, they make it new, they make it different, they make it fresh, and that's how they stick out. Moving on to the next question, we have NFT Fantastic who's asking, how do you build an A player team where they only work with you exclusively? To answer this question, it's SOPs. So SOPs are standards of operating procedures, and I do provide this within my YSS community. Basically like a step-by-step -step guideline on how things should be done. So I have SOPs for my script writers. I don't have ones for my voiceover artist just because I feel like that's pretty straightforward but I do have ones for my video editors and my thumbnail designers so SOPs are what's gonna make it so that you create a world-class a team to create your videos you set the expectations you set the standards and it's got to be as detailed as possible so that they can't get it wrong the idea behind an SOP is that if someone else reads that SOP they will also know how to do the job. Moving on to the next question, we have a question from JumpNet. He or she wants to know how to initially take off on YouTube. I don't recommend ads. Then again, I'm biased because I've never used ads. Everything I do is completely organic. But the way to take off on YouTube is that number one, know your niche and actually know what's upcoming or trending, okay? So know of any upcoming events, know of what's happening and try to capitalize on trending. And then afterwards, create a very well, high quality video surrounding that topic. I feel like at this point in the stage of how much experience I've had with YouTube, if I just know the niche well enough and I'm keeping up with whatever's up to date within that niche, I'm so confident that I can post a video and have it get like over a thousand views just because I know the niche that well. So that's how well you should know your niche and that's how you initially take off on YouTube. Now I'm not saying you can get your first video to go viral, although it can happen, but at least you won't be posting videos that get a big whopping zero views, right? As for the next question, we have one from Tay and he's asking, he or she's asking, what makes an intro engaging? The intro actually doesn't start within the video, it starts with your title and thumbnail, okay? And so what I mean by this is that if someone sees your title and sees your thumbnail, you better deliver what your title and thumbnail are talking about within the first 10 seconds of your video. That is the number one key thing I can give to you when it comes to your intro. If you clickbait too hard, yeah, you might get a 20% click-through rate, but if people are clicking off within the first 10 seconds, what's the point, you know? You're really good at click-through rate, so now let's kind of tie the actual video intro to actually what's being said you are going to deliver within your title and thumbnail. So ways to do it, short and sweet intro, deliver what you're talking about within your title and thumbnail. Try to include a lot of typography, animations, a lot of clip transitions. Another way that'll work is that you can actually include an original clip with audio to kind of introduce the video if that clip is funny or engaging. A lot of different ways you can kind of approach it. The overall thing is that just make sure that what you're talking about in your title and thumbnail is actually being delivered in your intro. Now, moving to the next question we have from Kenny Taylor Golf. He or she is asking how to make videos yourself for free that are easy. All the celebrity sports and movie clips seem hard and might get copyrighted. To make the videos for free, it sounds redundant, but obviously just do it yourself. There's some AI software out there. I think it's called like Pictori, but I'd rather use more meaningful and actually familiar pieces of engagement, such as clips from actual sports and celebrities. I don't recommend stock footage just because, you know, if I'm watching a video about a random person versus I'm watching a video about LeBron James playing basketball, imagine that person on the stock footage is playing basketball. Who am I gonna be more engaged to? The stock footage clip playing basketball or LeBron James playing basketball? To make your videos for free, you do gotta kinda like grunt work the workout. When I first started, I was making these videos by myself. I was compiling a ton of clips together. But as far as getting copyrighted claims for like using images or footage off of other celebrities or sports plays or something, that's not always gonna happen, okay? You just use short segments, cut it up, don't use original audio, or if anything, use very small segments of original audio, then just compile that together, add your original script and voiceover, and then call it a video. Don't be too worried about getting copyrighted. Just because copyright claims are not the bad thing, copyright strikes are much worse. Copyright claims, you simply just, I'll tell you how to fix it. So if you get a copyright claim of like the first minute of your video, what I'll do is I'll actually add images or basically sprinkle images throughout that first minute. So that kind of breaks the video footage into like different smaller segments. That's how I bypass copyright claims whenever I receive them. That's all I have for this video. If you enjoyed this Q&A video, do comment down below and do stay subscribed for when I do release my next Q&A session within my community board. Thanks so much for watching and I'll see you all in the next video.